Hi everyone, it looks like uh, there's about 40 people on the line here, uh, 41. We will be starting in just a few minutes. I just want to be sure that everyone is able to hear. Um, it looks like everything is working here from our end, but I want to be sure everything is working from your end. So if you could just type in the chat box, not the Q&A, but in the chat box that you can hear us, that would be great. And we'll get started in a few minutes. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the MPCA's webinar on updates to the Minimal Impact Design Standards or the MIDS Calculator. Um, my name is Ann Gelbman. I work here at the MPCA in the Stormwater Program. And with me this afternoon in the room is Mike Trojan. Uh, also with the MPCA, and Mike works in the stormwater program with me. And so uh, it's the two of us in a room um, speaking to all of you who are 
out there tuned into this web webinar to learn about the stormwater manual and the MIS calculator. So um, a few housekeeping things here before I turn it over to Mike. Um, please use the chat box if you have questions. Um, I think as a user you have a, the option of a Q&A or chat. We ask that you use the chat. I will be monitoring that as we're going through the presentation. We will try and answer all the questions that do come in uh, through the chat box. Uh, we'll try and get to those um, as soon as we can. Um, if we don't get to all the questions, um, we will go through all the questions after the webinar and we will answer them and all the questions and answers will be posted in the stormwater manual. There is a page called stormwater manual webinars and all the, um, the recorded version of this and the Q&A and the PowerPoint will be placed on that page in the stormwater manual. Professional development hours. Sorry about that. Um, 1.5 professional development hours will be offered, and uh, you can access that certificate on um, the same page, the Stormwater Manual Webinars page. And again, this PowerPoint um, will be available there. I think it's on there right now. So um, tentatively, we have plans uh, to do some upcoming webinars or webcasts um, in May and June. Some of the things we saw from previous surveys that we did, uh, we did a couple of uh, webinars that you may have tuned into, one on infiltration, uh, one on harvest and use, we did another one on funding. Uh, some of the things, and we did a survey, so some of the things that we saw in the survey results were people wanted more inform information on infiltration, biofiltration calculations, uh, credits, pollutant reductions, and so forth. Um, so we're thinking about having future webinars on those topics, so stay tuned. Uh, if we do schedule them, I'll be setting out something on Gov Delivery and also look in the events section of the Stormwater Manual for information on those. And if you have other topics, um, please let us know what you're interested in. And there's the uh, image of where we'll be posting future webinars. So there again, uh, you can see uh, pictures of us, myself, Anne, and Mike Trojan, and there's our contact information for Mike and a link to the stormwater manual, but it's easier if you just go to Google and do a search for Minnesota stormwater manual. And I am going to now turn it over to Mike. Thanks, Anne. Welcome. Good, a good afternoon, everybody. In the mid to all of the afternoon. No pun intended there. <laughs> yeah, um, one thing just before you get started, Mike, I am noticing that there are some people who are saying there's no sound. We are unmuted, so you should be able to hear us. If you don't hear us, um, well, if you don't hear us, you can't hear us. <laughs> So maybe I'll just send a, a little response to some of the people who are having problems. Okay, um, as Ann said in the email that she sent announcing this uh, webinar, um, we're going to go over the updates to the version uh, version three now of the MIDS calculator. Um, you don't have to be a MIDS calculator expert to um, for this webinar, but um, we do assume you have some familiarity with the calculator, and I'll, I'll be getting into the calculator a little bit later, and not necessarily showing some of the rudimentary things, but showing you the uh, updated features that we have. Um, so the version three was released in January on January 2nd, and so far we've had about 700 downloads, which is very encouraging. Um, we executed a work order last summer to provide updates to the calculator, and that's the focus of today. Um, our contractor was Bar Engineering, and Eric Novotny did the, the heavy lifting for, for this, and um, John Hansen was the project manager on behalf of Bar. Um, 
Where can you download the version 3 file? So if you're in the manual, um, you go to the Minimal Impact Design Standards page, and you can get at the calculator either at this link called Calculator or off on the right. For now, at least, we have this tab, and you can Suitable file. And those are the two files you need to download onto your computer, and then you'll be able to use the calculator. So the topics we're going to cover today um, are using version 2 files in version 3, um, an underground inf uh, infiltration best management practice that was incorporated as a new BMP, um, harvest and use, reuse BMP, which is modified from the previous version, uh, a new BMP called impervious disconnection. Um, we added an iron enhanced sand filter, iron enhanced feature to our sand filter, and then there are some other minor changes that I'll go over. So you can import version 2 files now into the calculator. Um, when you open the calculator, you'll see this option called Import Version 2. You'll want to click on that. You'll be asked to save the old file to a new version 3 file. And I don't know the answer to this offhand, but I believe it modifies your version 2 file. So if you wanted to save your old version 2 file, I'd probably recommend making a copy of that um, because I think you'll lose it if you go through this modification process. So after you um, name your new file, go get a cup of coffee uh, for a couple minutes because this process may take up to a couple minutes depending on how complex your version 2 file was. Um, don't do what I did, which was start clicking on a bunch of buttons wondering what's going on because you'll have to go through the process again just like I did. When everything finally gets done, you'll get this warning that basically says that some new parameters have been added and you may have to modify uh, a parameter or two that you had in your version 2 file. But at this point, you now have a new file, version 3 file, to work with. And it should populate with um, pretty much everything that you had in your previous version. Um, one of the new features on this, so this is the main screen when you come into the calculator. Um, you'll have to enter, like before, you'll have to enter a zip code that provides, here's the zip code, that provides the rainfall information that's needed. Um, you'll have to provide impervious surface area as before, but you'll also have to answer this question. This is a new question. Are you using the calculator to determine compliance with a construction stormwater permit? The reason we ask that question is because if you say yes, you cannot use the disconnection best management practice because it's not, um, it does not uh, meet the qualifications for permit compliance. If you answer no, that particular BMP, which I'll talk about later, um, can be used. Um, there are the typical defaults, so 1.1 inches, which is the MINT's performance goal, uh, phosphorus event mean concentration, TSS event means concentration, you can modify those if you want. You get a little flag saying you modify them, but, but you can go ahead. So if you have a one-inch infiltration standard, for example, you can enter that there. This other information is not necessary, but um, you can add things if you want. Um, so that's the – I forgot that I had that in there. <laughs> Darn it. Spent, I spent the whole two minutes putting those new features in, and then I forgot about it. <laughs> All right, so on to the first BMP that uh, we added. It's called Underground Infiltration. Um, it looks like this on the toolbar, um, and you'll click and drop, drag it later when we go through our example. We added this BMP because we had a previous BMP called something like Infiltration Trench, and it um, the underground infiltration allows storage both within the pipe and in the media, and you couldn't, um, the previous infiltration trench BMP did not account for both of those, and so we felt we needed a new best management practice. Like the, um, any BMP, any water that's um, stored below the outflow is going to infiltrate into your underlying soil. Anything that's above the outflow is considered to, to bypass the system and not get any treatment whereas you're getting 100% treatment for everything below that outfall. 
I'm going to go through an example on the screen here, and then I'll open up the miscalculator and do the same example so that you can see um, how you deal with it in the calculator. Um, so, example set, I've got five acres of impervious routed to an underground infiltration system. Um, the system consists of five half-circle pipes. Each are 10 feet in diameter, 75 feet long. The basin in which the pipes sit is 65 feet wide by 100 feet long. There'll be, a, there'll be one foot of engineered media beneath the pipes. The depth below the pipe outfall is, outflow is four feet, and we're on hydrologic soil group A soils. So it might look like something like this. We've got these five pipes, 60 feet long, and in, sitting in a, they're 10 feet wide, sitting in this basin, which is 65 by 100 feet. I'm sorry, the pipes are 75 feet long. And then a cross-sectional view, here's the outflow pipe. So anything that's below that is going to infiltrate into this one-foot media and eventually into the underlying soil. Uh, one of the complications with this best management practice is um, there are different pipe shapes, um, half circles, full circles, rectangular pipes, and uh, some of the equations are not necessarily straightforward. So um, there are a couple inputs into the calculator that um, are do actually done outside of the calculator in an Excel spreadsheet. And I'll go to that spreadsheet in a bit here. And that would be this underground pipe storage volume and then the engineered media surface area. So you'll need to enter those. The calculator is not going to make those calculations for you. I'm sorry, Mike, I need to interrupt you just for a moment because I know I'm seeing and in the chat box that some people are not able to hear, and I'm not really sure why. Um, so I'm wondering if um, possibly one, well, if those who are on who can hear, could you just please uh, put something in the chat box so that we can tell that you're hearing. We hope that most of you are able to hear, but some are not. Okay. All right. So some people are having issues, but it sounds like most of you are, are able to hear. So I'm not quite sure what's happening with the others. So Mike, you can continue. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so these are the two inputs you need to determine outside of the calculator. Um, to do that, um, the calculator, as we'll see in a, in a minute here, has this link which will take you to the manual and then to the Excel spreadsheet where you can make, make those calculations. This is what that spreadsheet will look like. Um, and for half circle pipes, it's going to ask you for a bunch of inputs about the pipe, the pipe, how many pipes you have, the dimensions of your system, and so forth. And it'll give you the two numbers shown here in salmon. I don't know what that color is, but um, these are the two inputs that you'll eventually need to put back into the calculator after you've entered the information into the spreadsheet. So for this particular example, we can see that we're getting about 1,767, so about 17,670-odd cubic feet of storage in the pipe in the media, so that would be um, the water that's stored above the underground engineered media, and then within the under engineered media, we're going to get another 2,275 cubic feet of storage there for a total of 19,951, which almost meets the performance goal for this particular example. That's the storage in the pipes adjacent and the media adjacent to the pipes, and that's the underground storage, uh, the storage in the media underneath the pipes. So I'm going to go to the calculator now. This is always a dangerous thing to do, but we'll see how it goes. So here's the icon for the miscalculator. And this is what you'll see when the calculator comes up. And I'm going to create a new file. Uh, let's just call it webinar. And it'll take a second. So here's that main screen that I talked about. 
And um, the zip code that I'm going to use for this example is 55105. Um, I'm going to have five acres of impervious, as I mentioned before, in the example. So this is copying that example I talked about. And we're going to go no with the permit compliance because later on I'm going to show how to use that disconnection BMP. And that would, if I answered yes, that would turn that BMP off. I'm going to leave the other defaults just as they are. So this is my site information. I'm going to go to schematic now. <coughs> Excuse me. And here's where my BMPs are. And there's some tracking information on the left. I'm not going to pay much attention to that because I'm just going through an example and the numbers are actually going to not make sense if you're tracking there. But if I was actually working on a site, I'd want to make sure these numbers were, were making some sense. But here's my underground BMP. I'm going to click on that and drag it on to the screen. And then I can either double click or right click to get into that best management practice. And so um, I'm going to enter five acres here. It's BMP by itself, so that's all I need to enter onto this screen. And I'll go now to the parameters tab. And again, I need to come up with the number for that underground pipe storage. I need to come up with the number for uh, surface area if I answer yes, whether there's engineered media. And the way to do that is to go to this link here. Um, unless you already have that information for your pipe, you can already enter it. But if you want to make the calculation, you click on that link. It'll take you to the manual. Here's the Excel spreadsheet. And just click on it, and it opens up in Excel. And so here's that spreadsheet. And so I'm going to scroll up to You can see there's different types of pipes here, full circular pipes, rectangular or hex pipes and then half circle. We have a half circle pipe, so that's the calculations that I'm going to do. So as I mentioned, my outflow depth was four feet. So that's this distance right here, as shown in the schematic. The depth of engineered media below the pipes is one feet. The width of my basin is 70, uh, 65 feet, I'm sorry, 65 feet. So that's the width across the basin. Uh, the length of the basin was 100, if you remember. Uh, that's going to make some calculations. Um, my pipe radius is 5 feet because these are 10-foot diameter pipes. The length of my pipe is 75 feet. I have five pipes. And I'm going to put a porosity in a 0.35. And now you can see that those two numbers are populated. And these are the two numbers you need to carry now back in to the calculator. So I'll go back to the calculator. I'll enter those numbers in. They were 17,676. Um, my overflow depth is four feet again. I do have engineered media, so I'm going to answer yes. And I have, this is where I need to enter my other number, and that's 6,500. For my cross for my area of my engineered media. My media is one foot deep. It needs that number so that it can calculate whether you're going to meet the drawdown time. It's not used in any calculations here in the calculator. My porosity was 0.35 and I have hydrologic group soil, hydrologic soil group A soils. My drawdown time is 48 hours. And 19,951 cubic feet. And you remember that's the number I came up with. So if I wanted to enter um, three feet of media, for example, you'll see that I don't meet the drawdown requirement anymore. So that's where that number comes in as a check. Fairly straightforward. I hope I know this is a little bit complicated to have to go out to this Excel spreadsheet, but. Um, it, it just was, we just found it was going to be very difficult to deal with all the different pipe uh, dimensions and so forth. And, and half circle calculations are not particularly straightforward either. So um, those are some of the reasons why we take you out of the um, calculator. Mike, there's a question that came in. Yep. 
shouldn't the drawdown time be based on the effective depth? Um, the de I'm not sure what what we're doing is we're calculating the distance it takes for. Let me see here. If I can go back. The dis the, the time it takes for the water to be out from below the outfall pipe to the bottom of the media, and that. So I'm not sure what effective. I mean, I know effective depth is. What some people means porosity, but porosity is not a factor in considering the drawdown time because we're considering the the vertical distance here. You don't have as much water here because you, you're 65 percent of this media space is being taken up by the solid material, but that 35 percent of water still needs to travel that one foot plus the four feet here. So the drawdown time is a function of the vertical distance and not the porosity. I don't know if that answers the question properly. But effective porosity certainly affects the volume that you're going to get. If, if this was all open area, this number would be much greater. Um, but you only have 35% for porous space. So, Steve, if that did not answer your question, maybe you could put a little more uh, clarification in the chat box. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Is that the only question we've asked so far? So far. Okay. There is mud, right? <laughs> but you can ask questions along the way um, going back in time. But at, uh, at this point, I'm going to keep moving on unless we have other questions. Okay. All right. So we did have the previous version, version two, did have a harvest and reuse slash cistern best management practice in it. Um, we have updated that. Um, BMP to include a couple new features. We think it's a better, a little better now, a little closer to, um, a little more accurate, and actually allows some more flexibility. So these are the main, five main changes from version two. This first sentence is a little long, and I thought about simplifying it, but I, I'll read through it and then I'll interpret it in layman's terms. But the calculation for water use utilizes a method for determining variable irrigation demand based on potential evapotranspiration from the irrigated area adjusted for vegetation type. Basically, we're bringing potential evapotranspiration into the calculation. Previously, the previous version, the version two of the calculator, relied only on uh, input from the user as to what their weekly irrigation rate is. Now we um, make a potential a calculation based on PET. We also allow the user to put in weekly irrigation rates. And unless you're on A soils, which I'll talk about in a second, unless you're on A soils, you can only irrigate um, up to the smaller of those two numbers. So if you put in irrigating 10 inches a week, you're not going to get 10 inches a week because you're going to be limited by the potential evapotranspiration. Um, the second point here, though, is for A soils, we do um, allow an adjustment to that. We allow users to input rates up to two inches a week um, because there are situations where you may be irrigating for the purpose of using water, not necessarily just to meet plant demand. Um, and A soils, we felt, could take this extra volume of water. I don't know why I keep staring at the computer like I'm looking at somebody. <laughs> I guess I got to look at something. Um, so for A soils, we can you can go up to two inches per week. Um, in July, June, July, your PET is probably at its greatest here in the year, and that's going to be about 1.2 inches per um, per week. So um, this does allow you some extra volume. Um, number three, water can only be applied if available in storage, and their daily irrigation considers precipitation that has fallen on that day. The previous calculator, if it rained on a given day. You couldn't get any irrigation credits, but if you only had, say, uh, five hundredths of an inch of rain and you had water in storage, um, you should be able to use that water. So the calculator now allows you to use that water uh, because you can go up to either your specified rate or your potential evapotranspiration. 
Um, you can also input a weekly volume retained for non-irrigation uses. Um, it's a big discussion item on our point because it's not necessarily, if you're using it for toilet flushing, you're not necessarily keeping the water on site. Um, our justification was that you're taking potable water and not using it to flush toilets, you're taking recycled rainwater, storm water, and we felt that that water savings was worth giving the credit for. And I know that's maybe, we've had some discussion about that here and maybe a little bit controversial topic, but um, we're, we are giving the credit for it. And we no longer allow March irrigation, which the previous calculator did. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> hey, Mike, um, one question did come in. I don't know if it's relevant to right now. Oh, okay. Go display settings. Where's it? Up top. Okay. 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 All right. Uh, one question came in. Uh, Riley says, going off the previous question, is the 48-hour MTCA drawdown requirement time from the outlet pipe invert to the bottom of infiltration BMP or from the high water level to the bottom of BMP? Uh, that's actually a good question. The, um, all of the water in the underground system has to be out by 48 hours. The drawdown time is, is a calculation based on the water below the invert of the pipe, but any water that's above that pipe also has to be out of there within 48 hours per, per the permit requirement, meaning that water has to get out through the outflow pipe. Um, so if you put 10 feet of water in there and you can only get four foot of infiltration, you've got to get that other six feet out within 48 hours. Basically, you have to have an empty system after 48 hours. It doesn't all necessarily have to infiltrate, but it all has to be out of there. So I already went through. That's why they didn't show up as close, because I didn't have this. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to go through two examples for the harvesting use, one with the pond being used for irrigation and the other for a cistern. Um, now, if you're going to use a pond, make sure that you include the pond best management practice in your schematic. And what you're going to do when we go through this example is you're going to drop the pond onto the schematic and then you're going to drop your reuse. You're going to route your water to the pond, not to the reuse system. You're going to route your impervious surface to the pond. And then from there, you're going to route that water through your reuse system. So for our example, we're going to assume a uh, one-acre pond that has two feet of available water. So we've got lots of water, 87,000 cubic feet. Um, it captures five acres of impervious surface. We're going to irrigate a six-and-a-half-acre ball field on A soils again. Uh, we're going to irrigate from May to September. And again, just a reminder, since we're on eight soils, we could irrigate up to two inches per week. It wouldn't allow us to do that if we we're on another soil type. So you have to, if you go back to the schematic, you'll see we've got two BMPs here, a pond and a harvest and use BMP. We have to populate the pond uh, BMP first. So we're going to route the water to this BMP. So the five acres of impervious surface is going to the pond BMP. We're then going to route the pond BMP to the harvest and use BMP. And this is where you would do that, where it says routing, the down, routing to your downstream BMP. And we'll go through this example in a bit. You also have to choose your pond design. And for this, we're going to choose pond design two. You don't get a volume credit for a pond, but you will get increased phosphorus and TSS reductions. So for this BMP, um, you're going to input the storage volume. Um, just a reminder not to route any water to run off to the BMP. Um, your irrigation application area here, I'll go through all of these. These are all the, BMP, the inputs that you're going to need. Um, we recommend that you have the system go offline in the during the off season. Um, 
The reason being that your annual volume calculations may be a little bit off, otherwise you keep the system online through the winter. Um, you can re retain non-irrigation water here, and I'll show that when we get to the cistern example um, after the pond example here. So again, I'm going to go out into the calculator. I'm going to close this other BMP. If I right-click here, I can get rid of that other BMP, which I'm going to do here. It takes a second. And so the harvest and use BMP is down here. Click and drag it. The pond BMP is right here. And you click and drag that there. I'm going to put it above because that's just more visibly appealing to me. Um, Again, right-click or double-click on the pond BMP. And so we're in the pond BMP. I've got five acres. Um, I'm going to input a number here. It's not necessary. But, and here, we're, I'm going to route downstream. I'm going to route this water to my harvest and use best management practice. BMP parameters tab, I click on, and again, the only thing I have to pick here is, you'll see here now that there's no uh, removal um, for phosphorus so far, but if I choose level two, the numbers pop in. And so you're going to get these uh, extra treatment um, when you route this to your on BMP rather than directly to your harvest and use system. So I'm going to click on OK. And now I'm going to, go, and you can see now that it's, the water is being routed from one BMP to the other. Double click on this. I'm not going to route any water here because all the water is coming from the upstream BMP. Uh, that's important. If you put five acres in here again, now you've got 10 acres impervious, which is not correctly mod modeling this system. So I'll go directly to the inputs. And again, those were, let's see, I look at my cheat sheet here. 87,120, lots of water available there. We're going to irrigate six and a half acres. Um, we can input a daily irrigation rate here. We're going to put in two inches a week. And that's going to be on age soils. We're going to, we're going to, and one thing you notice is that we're asking the vegetation type. Um, there are some calculations behind here for different types of vegetation. Um, so you get a better credit on vegetables, I believe, versus or turf or something. I don't remember the exact numbers, but you can go into manual and get that technical information if you need to. We're going to start irrigating in May. We're going to end in September. This example, I don't know why that keeps popping up, but this example, we are not going to use any water on site for non irrigation. Um, you'll see that the pond, there's plenty of water in the pond to, to meet our irrigation needs. And you'll see here that the total volume ends up being 19,213 cubic feet. You'll see that. The average achieved irrigation application rate is 1.9 inches. I'm not quite sure why that isn't quite two. Um, but if I was to go back here, if you see it's 19,213, if I was to go back here and put in a B soil, that number should drop. And it does all the way down to 11,000. Because we can no longer, even though I put in two inches, it's not going to let me do that because I'm on a B soil. So now it's defaulting back, and you can see that the average irrigation rate is 1.11 inches per week, as opposed to what we had with the, the, the force two inches per week. So quite a bit of difference there between those two. So, and as, as always, you can go in and look at the BMP summary for any best management practice that you're in, and it will provide you with an annual summary um, it'll show you uh, volume removal, 
how close you are to meeting the performance goal, which is uh, we're 96% of the way there. Um, and then your annual volume, or annual particular phosphorus removal and so forth, dissolved phosphorus, and then TSS, I think, is at the bottom. And if you wanted, if you had multiple BMPs, you could go into the results page here. So this would be your summary for the entire um, site. And so in this case, we do have two BMPs, and it would show you how each of those two BMPs is performing. So I'm going to go back and remember to maximize this. It's probably going to ask me to do that again. <laughs> So now I'm going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, now I'm going to have a cistern instead of a pond. And so I'm going to route the water, uh, route runoff to, um, directly to a cistern. And from there, I, I'm going to irrigate a ball field, but I'm also going to use some water for non-irrigation purposes. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to assume I have a 30,000 gallon tank capturing one acre of rooftop. It's a big roof irrigating one acre of ball field on any soils. <coughs> Excuse me. And the irrigation is from May to September. Again, we're on any soils, and we're going to take a credit for non-irrigation purposes. <coughs> so, 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 this is, so we'll go into the calculator in a second, and you'll see where I put all these in. And for now, I'm not retaining any water. If I put no there, I can't achieve my performance goal. You see that I'm at, what, is that about 2,500 or something? 2,956. 2,9.56, and I need to get to 39, 3993. So I can't get there just by irrigating. I could get there if I increase the application area, but if I only have one acre of all field, I, I can't do anything about that, so um, so I, uh, if I use water for non-irrigation purposes and make some assumptions, so let's just assume this is a stadium where we've got 7,000 people coming in for a game, uh, flushing the toilet once, two gallons per flush. I know that um, when I go to a game, this is about seven flushes per person per game, <laughs> um, but let's just assume it's three games per week. And that's where I came up with that number there. And so typically the volume credit is, is limited by the size of the cistern. You can see with the pond system, this number is not going to make much difference um, in the total calculation. But if you have a, a cistern with a limited volume space, you may need some extra credit, which you can maybe get through non-irrigation purposes. Like I said, you could increase your application area, and I'll show that in a second here, and that would get you to your performance goal, too. <clears throat> so, go back out. Let's get rid of that BMP. And we're going to go in here again and just modify this. So, in this case, we have a, we're going to have one acre of rooftop. Again, I'm just going to put a number. We're not going anywhere with the water, so it's one acre of repurpose going to this BMP. I have to change these as from the previous calculation. So I have 4,000 cubic feet of storage in my cistern. I'm applying it to one acre, a one acre ball field. Um, I'm answering yes because I'm going to put two inches of water on uh, a type soil. Everything else is the same. Every, the system goes offline. It's run from May to September. It's on turf. And you can see, again, if I don't use the water for non-irrigation purposes, I'm not going to get my performance goal. I get 29.56 versus 39.93. So I'm going to change this, and now I'm going to use some of that water for toilet flushing. And I think the number was 56.15. And obviously, that's going to get us to our performance goal of 39.93. Now, if I had said no here, and we hadn't, again, we can change this number to say two acres, you can see that I'll meet my performance goal. 
I drop the size of the cistern, it's going to be harder to meet the performance goal too. So using a cistern versus a pond, it's much more sensitive to the amount of water that's available in that system um, to irrigate. You got any questions? Uh, we did. Just want to go back to PowerPoint. Or yeah, go back to PowerPoint. Okay. And okay. So uh, we did get another question from Jeremy, and he said related to the previous question about the 48-hour drawdown. He's saying um, if all the water must drain in 48 hours from the peak water elevation. What storm event must be used? A hundred year, ten year, two year? And from what point in the storm, assuming a 24 hour storm, does the 48 hours start at zero, 12 hours, or 24 hours? Or at the time of peak elevation? Kind of a long question. Yeah, and I could answer parts of it, and parts of it I can't answer, and I think the best thing on this question, because it is a complicated question, um, the part that I can't answer is that the, the design part of the storm, that's up to the person, that's up to the people designing the system, what, what storm you want to design it for. Um, the water just needs to be out of there within 48 hours before the next storm, but the rest of that question, I think it's probably best that I sit down with our engineers and talk to them, and we probably will then will post the answer to this. I apologize for not getting to it right away, but I don't want to give out any bad information, um, at least more more so than usual. Uh, so um, <laughs> yeah, we'll be sure and get the Q and A posted probably by Monday for sure. Okay, so that's a good question for our engineers. Um, they're the ones who actually deal with these types of things more and more with the permit and exactly what the, the language in the permit and the civil annoyances of the, the language in the permit. So I don't want to say something that's in, incorrect. So I apologize for that, but we will post the answer to this question online. All right, that was it. Questions? How's that for avoiding <laughs> questions? We'll give it to the engineers to decide. Right. I wonder if any of them are listening. There is. <clears throat> I haven't, haven't responded yet. At least one. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm going to move on to the next BMP. Um, this is a new one we've added to the calculator. It's the impervious disconnection best management practice. And you can see that it is right here on the icon tab. You would drag, pull and drag that over. Um, so you can divert runoff from an impervious surface to a pervious surface, for example, from a parking lot to turf, from a roof to a lawn, or whatever it happens to be. This BMP cannot be used for construction stormwater permit compliance. So way back in the early part of the webinar, you remember you have to answer that question whether you're using it for permit compliance or not. And if you answered yes, you will not be able to use this BMP, it's essentially turned off. Um, and the calculations are based on some swim modeling that was done as part of the MIDS work group several years ago, um, in which they were looking at the effects of improving turf and routing impervious surface to pervious um, areas. It's a fairly simple best management practice. Um, you're just going to simply uh, enter the amount of impervious area that you're routing to an effective pervious area. Um, it's important to note, though, that your effective pervious area cannot be any wider than 100 feet um, because there's evidence that channeling begins to start after that 100 foot. Um, after water moves 100 feet, you start to get channeling out here, and so you no longer really have um, what's called an effective per pervious area. You'll need to input the soil type, and then this basically looks at um, some performance curves that were developed as part of the swim modeling and picks off some appropriate numbers and returns a volume reduction capacity of that best management practice. 
So you need your impervious area routed to the previous area, which is limited to 100 feet in width. Also, your previous area cannot exceed your impervious area. And you need soil type. So we'll go through an example here. Uh, we're going to route one acre of impervious to one acre of pervious surface. Uh, we'll go to two examples, A and B soil, just to show you the differences in the, the volumes for those. And you can see that here infiltration on the A soil is about 2,800 cubic feet compared to about 2,100 some cubic feet on the B soil. So you're getting significantly more infiltration on the A soil, which you would expect. But in neither case are we meeting the performance goal um, for this best management practice. And that's partly because we're, if it's raining, we're all raining on, already raining and dropping water on this effective pervious area. So we're adding additional water on top of that. And so it's just difficult to infiltrate that volume of water and meet the performance goal. Okay, I'll go back into the calculator. I'll get rid of this BMP. And I drag, click and drag the disconnection BMP onto the screen here. Double click or right click to open it up. And I'm going to put one acre of impervious surface. And here I need to enter the pervious surface because this is where it's going. So I need to enter that here. And that's going to be one acre. This BMP is by itself again, so we're not routing anything anywhere. Um, by the way, you can change the names of your BMPs if you want here, um, in addition to routing them somewhere else. Click on the BMP parameters tab. And I'm routing one acre, so that's going to be 43,560 square feet to one acre of pervious, 43,560. And we're going to do that on A soil. And you can see that we've got 2,800 cubic feet, not enough to get to the performance goal. Mike, I think a question came in. I think it's relevant right now. Um, is this impervious disconnection? have to assume 100% disconnection. Do you want to answer that now? Is that? I'm not exactly sure what that means. It, uh, it just means you're taking a, 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 an impervious area that you know and routing it to this pervious surface. So if you have a five acre parking lot and you're only routing one acre of that five acre parking lot onto the pervious surface, then that would be your impervious, redirected impervious would be the one acre, not the full five acre impervious parking lot. I don't know if that's... Yeah, and then he goes on to say that swim five allows users to choose the level of disconnection from 1% to 100%. Okay, yeah, I'm not familiar with that feature. I, so I, I, I hope what I just said, so if I'm understanding the question right, when I'm not, probably not, because I usually miss these things. Um, if you had a, a five-acre parking lot, it sounds like if you were in this version of SWIM, you could uh, put in 20% and route one acre of that five acres to this particular pervious area. Um, I don't know if that's my a correct interpretation. Here, it's just asking for what your redirected impervious area is. It's not asking for your impervious area. Um, so I guess maybe, maybe, let's say you had a five-acre parking lot, you would put maybe five acres here, and that would be your performance goal. And you're, but you're only going to route one acre of that to a previous area. Now you can see your performance goal has really jumped up, as you would expect, close to 20,000 cubic feet. And you're only still you're getting the same amount off of this DMP. So. In this situation, you'd have to find a way to treat that other four acres plus the additional volume that you're not getting towards the performance goal here. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and, and Jeff asked that question. And Jeff, if you um, if it's not answered, if we're not answering your question, 
Um, oh, you just said that is a correct assumption. So okay. I think we're good. Okay. If not, just send another, um, use the chat box to send another message. Okay, so what we would do, and I don't want to belabor this point, but what we might do in this situation, okay, so what I've done is I've changed this to five acres now, which is different than example, but I'll just stay on this for a minute. So, so now I'm routing five acres so to only the one acre of impervious, or to per one acre of impervious. This might be a situation where I might then route this to an underground infiltration system. So I would route that BMP maybe to that BMP. So I'm getting partial treatment on this disconnection BMP and routing whatever's left over to this other BMP. So, and that's maybe one of the flaws with this webinar is I'm focusing on these individual BMPs. I'm not talking about any treatment trains, so um, maybe it would have been a, a good idea to have an example um, where I use multiple, multiple BMPs. Maybe if there's time, I could conjure something up, although it's always dangerous to think and do things on the, on the fly. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be the example maybe he was getting at. So I'm going to go back to this, though, real quickly and go back to the one-acre example that I was using. And so now we're back down to 39.93 for our performance goal. And with the A soil, we're getting, oh, it looks like a little over about 75%, 70% of the way there, whatever. And if it went to B soil, it's going to drop. 2173, considerably less. And of course, if I went to the sea soil, I'd get even less, less retention down to 1995. So not as much of a drop there as I might have expected. But. So that's fairly straightforward. BMP, again, uh, just a reminder about the 100 foot width restriction here. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go back to okay. okay. I borrowed this from Tom Schuler for all of those of you who are looking at something other than me because it's all about me. Um, it's just to get you back focused on what we're here to do, which is to deal with this webinar. Anyways, thanks, Tom Schuler, for that little trick. I don't know if it works or not. Um, I do some adjunct teaching and I found as, as time goes on, another trick that works in class, halfway through the class is to say, time for a pop quiz, and everybody seems to get, get wake up all of a sudden. So we're more than halfway through, so that's, that's appropriate, Mike. Okay, so another modification we did was to add an iron enhancement the option for an iron enhanced sand treatment, sand filter. We did have sand filter, where is it? Right there. We did have it in the previous version of the calculator, but you, okay, is that me? We did have it in the previous version of the calculator, but you only got treatment for particulate phosphorus. There was no treatment for dissolved phosphorus. And so, now we're allowing the option to put in an iron enhancement. Um, actually, I don't think it's iron, I think it says amendment. I'll have to look at the language when I open the calculator. So it's the same as the previous hand filter, but it asks if you're adding an amendment to attenuate phosphorus. So I don't, I think this slide is actually mislabeled. It should be adding an amendment to attenuate phosphorus. So I'm going to go through an example, one acre of impervious surface draining to a sand filter. Sizing information is not needed because this is not a volume reduction best management practices. In practice, you're only getting treatment for phosphorus and, and total suspended solids. And then if you add an, an amendment to treat the iron, you're going to get a 40% credit on the dissolved phosphorus versus no credit with no amendment. You can see that here, there is no amendment. You're not getting any dissolved phosphorus treatment. If you answer yes, you're going to get a 40% credit for the dissolved fraction. And the reason I harped on the mislabeling of the previous slide, it said iron amendment, and this is in the calculator, and it just asks you if you're adding an amendment. 
If you go into the manual, you're going to get a 60% credit for an iron enhanced sand filter instead of 40%. So the miscalculator is in somewhat of disagreement with the manual right now, which is giving a higher credit because um, the manual is based on an iron amendment. And there are other amendments available um, to use, and those are discussed in the manual and I'm sure elsewhere in the literature. So right now that's the reason why we've kind of backed off and are only given 40% credit. Our research scientist, David Fairburn, is working with a number of folks on these. There's a lot of these systems in place out there now and um, trying to determine whether or not the credit is appropriate or whether it should be um, greater. In theory, in theory, this credit should actually be higher, but the systems aren't performing. A lot of these systems aren't performing the way we thought they were going to. And we think a lot of it has to do with design and operation and maintenance rather than the, the actual theory, because in theory the numbers should be higher. But anyways, I digress for a second. And we'll go back into the calculator. Okay, I'll get rid of my previous EP. I don't have to get rid of it, but so I'll go down to my sand filter here, click and drag that on. And again, you see this calculator does not require, require sizing because it's not a volume reducing best management practice. So I'm going to do one acre of impervious going to this. I'll go to the BMP parameters tab. And the only question you have to answer there is whether or not you're adding an amendment. And so if we say no, um, you're getting no credit. If you say yes, you're going to get a 40% credit. Pretty straightforward. Um, cheap um, inputs here. And um, in a minute here, I'll take you to some of the help functions within the calculator if you're not familiar with those. Okay, so I'll go back to the PowerPoint. Slides. All right, there's some other changes in the calculator. Um, these, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> pay close attention to this slide. Yeah, for, for those of you who know me, you probably get it. For those of you who don't know me, you're probably going, what the hell is he doing? I didn't get it at first. You just have to pay attention to the year zero and then just keep going. <laughs> For those of us who have been exposed to male pattern baldness through their, through their lives, it is a change that you have to go through. And at some point in your life, you just accept it. And uh, this seven-year-old boy that gets on the bus with me in the morning, and he asked me one time why I don't have any hair on my head, and I said, well, that's why I have hair on my face. So, anyways, there are a number of other changes in the calculator that I'm just going to go over briefly. Um, I'm not going to go into the calculator to show these, but they're pretty straightforward, hopefully fairly, fairly self-explanatory. The previous version of the calculator, if you raise the under drain above the bottom, it, did, it only gave you credit for water stored below that under drain. If you put the under drain at the bottom, it gave you credit for water infiltrating through the bottom. And what we recognized was that you could raise the under drain and actually reduce your infiltration because you're not you lost the credit for water infiltrating to the bottom. So now we've corrected the calculator so that if you raise the under drain, you get credit for the volume stored below that under drain, as well as water that's seeping into the under drain while this system drains down. And so you look down here and you can see this volume reduction below the under drain as well as volume reduction from infiltration out the bottom and the sides of the practice. So it's um, not a huge number, but it's a number, and it helps you get towards your performance goal if you're on C or D soils, for example. I keep forgetting that I put these little props in. The point of putting them in is I'm not going to use them. Um, permeable pavement with an under drain. Um, we are asking the question now, are you 
um, going to compact to subsoil? If you answer no, uh, you keep the infiltration rate for D soil, which is, was in the calculator before, which is 0.06. So while this thing is graining, you're getting 0.06 inches per hour drainage through the bottom. If you answer yes to this question, we reduce it to 0.03 inches per hour. Um, because you've, you've done some compaction in your system and reduced the infiltration rate. At least that's the assumption. Again, it's not going to be a big number because these are pretty low infiltration rates, um, but it may make a bit of a difference. A swale with a bioretention base. I'm not sure why the picture isn't showing up here, but um, it used to be in the old calculator that if you had a bioretention base, it assumed that the entire swale was underlying, had a bioretention base under it. That may not be true. So we're asking you, is the entire swale underlain by a bioretention base? And if it is, well, then you get credit for having a bioretention base under the entire system. And so you're going to get the infiltration storage through that um, base. But if only part of your system, if your answer is no, you're only going to get credit for that part of the bioretention system that has the that bioretention, uh, the swale system, I'm sorry. You're only going to get credit for that part of the swale that is underlined by the bioretention system. We also limited the media depth to three feet. We previously didn't limit the media depth, and you could put in some astronomical numbers here and get some really funny results. So we now limit that media depth to three feet. And finally, bioretention and tree BMPs, we change the particulate phosphorus credit from 45 to 80 percent for soil mix C or D, or if you have a low soil, low soil phosphorus content. Uh, this was just simply a mistake in the previous calculator version. It's not based on any new data or revelations. It was just an error in the previous, previous calculator. For those of you who aren't familiar with this, um, so I'll make C or D or low phosphorus content issue. If you have an underdrain in your system and you have a soil mix A or B, which both of which have high organic matter con concentrations, um, the literature is showing that these systems are actually leaching phosphorus. And so you're not going to get any credit unless you can show that you have a low phosphorus concentration in your soil. Soil mixes C and D have low organic matter contents, and so they're assumed to not leach phosphorus because they're assumed to have a low soil phosphorus concentration. So um, we've added two new mixes to the manual, and those don't show up in the calculator um, at this point in time. That would probably be something we would fix in the next iteration, which probably weighs off in the future yet. Uh, we made sure that the uh, MIDS calculator was compatible with Excel 2013. And a bioretention basin with an underdrain. Um, if you answer yes, if you have a raised underdrain, we take out the option to put in a liner. It doesn't make any sense to raise an underdrain and then put a liner into your bioretention basin. So it's just, a, just an attempt to reduce the potential for strange results. And version 3 is Windows 10 compliant. We made sure of that. Where can I find help and guidance? In them? Well, you can contact me if you want an answer. But if you want the right answer, uh, look for links in the wiki or use the help button. And those are shown here. And I'll actually go into the calculator and show where you can get to those. Um, let's, doesn't matter which BMP, let's go ahead and use the one we've got. If I click on help, in theory it should take me to the manual, take me to a page. So I was in the sand filter, if you remember I had the sand filter BMP up. So it takes me to a page called requirements, recommendations, and information for using the sand filter as a BMP in the MIS calculator. So go through the user inputs that you need. It'll describe the methodology, the calculations, what assumptions you have, 
and I'll give an example. Right now, most of the examples on these pages are version 2. Um, we'll probably update that over time. We did update, so let me go back here real quick. I'm going to X out of this. I'll bring back this underground PMP. Click on that. If I go to help here. Good job. What did I do? Oh, I said okay. It's not okay. <laughs> Click on help. It'll take me to a page of uh, recommendations for using underground infiltration. Same thing here. Calculator inputs for the different tabs in the calculator. The model input requirements and recommendations, calculations so you can see what we're doing, how, how we came up with the numbers. And then an example. And you can see that for those new PMPs, we actually do have version 3 examples in here. And it takes you through some of the screenshots in the example. I don't believe this example matches the one that we use today in the webinar, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. And you can see all the screenshots. Um, I think if I go back here, yep, you should be able to get, I don't know if this takes you to that page, I think that takes you to, oh, it does take you to the same page, okay. So look for those links, if you're, if you're struggling, look for the help button or the links on the page that you're in, if you want to get into the manual and, and get some help. Um, you can find the links to all those pages on this page called links to manual links to manual pages that address the MIS calculator and you can see that all the BMPs are there in fact I'll go ahead and click on that go into the manual and you can see that all those Recommendation pages are here for bioretention, bioinfiltration, biofiltration, swales, and so forth, green roof, and, and so forth and so on. Um, and that's the pages I already went to the page to show what it looks like. Um, if you hover over page contents, oops, up right up there, you'll see page contents. If you hover over that, it'll tell you the, it'll give you a, a table of contents for the page, and then you can click on any of those and um, get to that particular part of that page in the manual. Are there any questions at this point? Any questions? I'm not seeing anything in the chat box. If anyone has any questions about what Mike just went over, please uh, send a message in the chat box and we'll do our best to answer it. One thing I'll mention while you all think about whether you have questions or not is we're looking into the possibility of creating instructional videos, YouTubes, basically they'd be generally be a half hour in length. And they would be instructional videos intended to focus on a specific topic. Not necessarily just a miscalculator, but I, I think that that would be a good place to start with some of these instructional videos if we're able to make that happen. So um, keep your eyes open for, the, for that announcement. Um, hopefully we'll find, get an answer to that in the next day or two. And if we can do that, then we'll start putting those instructional videos together and getting those on into the manual. Yeah, they wouldn't be live uh, webinars like we're doing now, but we would just record them and then place them into the manual. But if we do have the technology to do that and are able to, we will certainly let you know. There are a couple. All right. Uh, Jessica wants to know, for underground infiltration systems, would it be acceptable to get your volume below your outlet and your media surface area directly from your HydroCAD model. Yes. Yep, I, I should have emphasized that. And if you go into the manual, it'll say that basically, that you can use that spreadsheet to get the volume. But you may have 
you may already have that information from the um, manufacturer of the device, that you, the type of device that you bought, or from some other modeling, HydroCAD or whatever it be. So um, you just need to come up with that number um, in some defensible fashion, whatever that happens to be. We built the Excel, Excel spreadsheet to, just as a tool, one tool that people can use to get at those numbers. All right. Um, another question here. Uh, the disconnection BMP cannot be applied toward compliance with permit because it does not capture an instantaneous volume. However, this type of BMP seems as though it would perform similar to a swale side slope or swale with no check dam. Could you explain further? Um, We've had that discussion here internally, <laughs> and um, I, yeah, I, I agree with you. It, it's, um, it was just a decision I think that was made at some point in the past that swales were going to be given a credit. They were part of the MIDS process, um, and I, you know, I think you make a, a reasonable argument um, why one and not the other. And it's just, I guess it's just an arbitrary decision that we, we made here. Um, you don't get a lot of credit, I don't believe, for swales if you don't have a check dam or a bioretention base in them. But nevertheless, there is a credit there. So, yeah. I'll pass that one on. We could elaborate on that a little more with our engineers, possibly. Yeah, probably. I already got Mike on my bad side here. <laughs> Uh, we did get a comment here that swales are very hard to protect as an infiltration practice during construction. Yeah. Okay. So is that just a comment or? Yeah, swales are very hard to protect as an infiltration practice during construction. Okay. Um, I should add maybe a note too that we are looking to update the swale section in the manual in the in the coming months. We're in the process of writing a work order. We realize it hasn't been updated since the original manual in 2005, and we think that there's a lot of new information out there. So hopefully we'll have that in the manual by the end of the year. Uh, let's see here. Um, why are BMPs used to satisfy, satisfy CSW permit excluded from these calculations? Mm, sure. Uh, why are BMPs used to satisfy CSW permit excluded from these calculations? I'm not sure I understand. I'm not sure I understand that either. Noah, if you could clarify that a little better. Yeah. Can, you, can you give me an example? That would that would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. We're not we're not clear on your question. Any other questions that people have? Uh, we've had over a hundred people on this webinar, so that it's really great that we uh, we're seeing so much interest in the updated MIPS calculator. One thing, as long as we've got some folks on on online here, even though we're going to put we're hoping to put these tutorials together. We've also had discussions about um, actual live workshops. Um, you know, we obviously, we, we have limited resources, can't do a lot of them, but we have talked about getting out and doing live workshops on the MIPS calculator. Um, if, if there's interest in that, let us know. You can either do it through the chat box or emailing us or whatever, but if there is interest in in these live workshops, which I think are you know, more hands-on, where we actually get out and can work with people um, in smaller groups, probably 15 to 20 at a time, or maybe even smaller, 10 to 15. Um, let us know if you think that that would be useful to you. Um, um, okay, so Mike, Noah did clarify that question. Um, he said, you mentioned earlier that if BMPs are used to satisfy the construction stormwater permit, the calculator defaults to exclude them from further treatment calculations. 
I don't remember saying that. I don't. I don't either. No, maybe we can take this offline. And um, if you want to send me a, an email and with your phone number, we can we can discuss this with you. Yeah, I don't. If I said that, that's not correct. Um, and I didn't mean to imply that if I was talking about the impervious surface disconnection one. Oh, he said you were talking about disconnected impervious at the time. Yeah. So that credit that that BMP is not available for. Construction stormwater permit compliance because it doesn't capture the instantaneous volume. So and that BMP, the origin of that BMP is I, I had a lot of people approach me asking me about that BMP, not with respect to permit compliance, but with respect to TMDL compliance. I guess that's a permit compliance issue too. So that BMP was actually inserted more for its pollution reduction abilities than its volume reduction. You do get volume credit for it, but as I showed, you're probably not going to be able to achieve your performance goal with that. And we did have the modeling that was done as part of the MID, so we did use that to, to give you volume credit, but really that BMP was primarily brought into the calculator for pollution reduction credits. And, and maybe I should have focused a little bit more on, on those pollution reduction credits when I showed that practice. So if you go back into, if you go into the calculator, look at those credits for phosphorus and TSS, because that's, that really kind of was, I think, the focus of that thing. Okay, we are getting a couple people that are volunteering to host workshops in their area, and that's really great. We'll be in touch with you. Um, a couple other people are asking uh, that they'd like to get the PowerPoint file. That's actually available in the stormwater manual right now. If you go to the manual to the table of contents, um, Mike is pulling it up right now. So, yeah. Table of contents, and then you scroll down to communications and outreach, stormwater manual webinars. And this is where you're going to find the recorded webinar, probably tomorrow if I get it. But the PowerPoint file, um, Mike is highlighting right there. Uh, you and the PDHs are there too, right above the PowerPoint. And, then, so, and as Ann said, the recording will be here too whenever we get around to that. Yep. And the Q and A actually will be here too. If you go to the yep. previous webinars, we do post those. So. Yes. All right. I don't see any other questions coming in, and. Uh, no other questions? No, I don't see any other questions, and people are starting to drop off. Okay, so. so <laughs> there's where the PDHs will be. Mike showed you that um, a few minutes ago. So um, if we don't have any other questions, I think, was that the last slide, Mike? We get out of class early today. Yay. All right. Hey, thanks, everyone, for uh, tuning in. And... Um, Get those PDHs and we'll be sending you further information. Thank you very much. Have a good day.